Welcome everyone to Tourism Review Webinar, uh, where we can learn more about publishing in top C uh, SSCI journals and getting recognition for your research through citation. I'm Shino from Emerald Publishing. Before we start, uh, please allow me to go through some housekeeping rules. On your screen, the orange arrow opens and closes your control panel. You can change the audio options to a computer or phone anytime during the webinar. All attendees' microphones are muted. Use the question tab to ask the presenter anything during the presentation. At the end of the session, we have time for question and answer. Uh, this session will be recorded and shared with everyone. Participants receive a post-webinar email along with attendance certificate and recording link two hours after the webinar. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to pass the floor to our um, senior professor, Gary Tan Han, who is also our Emerald Ambassador. Uh, over to you, Prof. Okay, thank you so much, Shino. So hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Publishing a Talk. SSCI journals and getting recognition for your research through citation. I'm Gary from UCSI University, and both distinguished chair Professor Ui Keng Boon and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar is about 1.5 hours long with 30 minutes for questions and answers. All right, let's get started with the welcoming remark by the director of the Center for Business Informatics and Industrial Management, distinguished chair Professor Dr. Ui Keng Boon. Uh, thank you, Gary. Good afternoon from Malaysia, and thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. I am King Boon, the Director of the Center for Business Informatics and Industrial Management at UCSI University, Malaysia. Uh, we are extremely thrilled and encouraged to see the number of responses. I understand from Prof. Gary that we have more than 500 participants registered today, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the participants who have joined us from far and wide. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Ohalis from Bonnard University Business School and the Editor-in-Chief of the most established journal in tourism, Tourism Review, Emerald, for taking time to share his insight on the topic publishing in top SSCI journals and getting recognition for your research through citations. Prof. Ohalis is a prolific writer and has established has published extensively, and it's our wish that you will find this webinar useful and informative. Finally, today's webinar would not be possible without the support and coordination from Shino, G, and William from Emerald Publishing, who have generously provided us with a platform to host the webinar. Thank you very much, and I hope our cooperation between UCSI University and Emerald will continue to prosper in the near future. Thank you very much again, and over to you, Gary. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Ui. We will now kickstart by introducing our honorable speaker, Professor Dimitrios Buhalis. Professor Buhalis is a strategic management and marketing expert with specialization in information, communication technology, smart environments, and interactive marketing. He is an expert in technology applications in the tourism, travel, hospitality, and leisure industries. He is Professor of Smart Tourism at Bonnemouth University Business School and the Editor-in-Chief of the most established journal in tourism, Tourism Review. Professor Dimitrios Buhalis was recognized as a highly cited researcher in 2020, 2021, and 2022 by Clarivate. His research is referred widely, being the second most cited in tourism, the first most cited in hospitality, the 10th in strategy, and the 23rd in marketing on Google Scholar, with more than 75,000 citations and an age index of 117. A very impressive profile. For today's webinar, we have pre-selected 10 key questions for Prof. Buhalis to answer. Without much further ado, I will now pass the control to Prof. Buhalis. Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the seminar. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got, hold on a second, not yet. Show my screen, not yet. Uh, I will tell you when to show my screen. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you, and it's uh, fantastic to share some of the uh, developments of Tourism Review and also some of the major developments 
in publication, in, in uh, business management, and of course, tourism, hospitality, leisure, research, transportation. Uh, thank you for doing uh, this, and thank you to Emerald, my publisher, for organizing that, uh, and to Gary and uh, Oi for organizing all, all those things, so we can share the, um, all the developments and understand how people can be successful when we're doing it. I think it's important to understand that most of the editors or all the editors are really doing um, this because they they want to make sure that they publish the best research. So quite often we are seeing as the goalkeepers uh, in publications and, and we reject a lot of papers, but it's really an understanding of how you can be better in 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 playing um, uh, the the game and how you operate, you're doing better research that, that get you published. And and all the editors I know in and in, in in tourism management, business, and and everything, they are we're going out out of our way to find the best suitable research to publish. And and that is really uh, something that we need we need to focus on. Uh, let me see. I, I don't like this program, as you as you know, but um, let me see how I can actually share my screen. And I'd like to go through uh, a little presentation. I'll try to make it for about 20 minutes or so uh, to show uh, to showcase to you um, what we are doing and how we can uh, how tourism uh, review is is doing things and also how you can improve your own record. I don't know if you can see. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. okay. Now, if you can see, but I don't. Okay, that's fine. I really don't like this program. Okay. Um, so let me start with a little bit of information about uh, me and what I do. And if you want to get in contact with me, that's my digital footprint. You can get connected to all my profiles from there. Uh, I've done tourism review for about seven or eight years now, since uh, 2017. And also I've done the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing, as you know, during the COVID years. This was a, a major uh, project that, that brought together uh, about 1,500 different participants from around the world um, to define tourism and, and create a whole range of things. Uh, Gary talked about my profile, and you can see all that in Google Scholar. I recently had to fix, um, to re redecorate my house, so I put all my books together, and I hadn't realized how many books I've had. Uh, it just, I just, it just um, took a whole self. Uh, on my bookcase, and now I don't have more space, but I'm still writing three or four books, and I'm not sure where they're going to go. Uh, so in the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing, as I said, uh, 2 million words, 3,528 pages, and it's really something that needs to be on your library, um, because if it's not in your library, uh, your students are not learning from it. Um, so some of the other books that we've done recently is The Smart Cities and The Serie Economy, and also the gamification for, for tourism. So all my research is primarily on tourism and technology. Now, I'd like to make you aware of three conferences that I'm organizing for in the next few months. So the first one is in Malta, uh, between 25 and 27 of November. Uh, please join us on that. And again, I'll be giving you QR code so you can see the different, uh, the different events and you can join us or take a picture of, of, of that. And then we're organizing the big enter conference in Wrocław in Poland in February 2025. Again, this will be focusing on tourism and technology. Uh, absolutely incredible uh, amount of speakers that will be there, and they will all talk about tourism and technology. And uh, in Dijon in Paris, uh, in, in, in France, uh, we'll have the Association of Marketing Science uh, Global uh, uh, World Marketing Congress in uh, July 2025. So these are the events that um, I will strongly encourage you to, to attend. Now, everything we do about uh, tourism is really about supporting communities and it's really about supporting 
the um, the sustainable development goals and make sure that the communities benefit, especially from tourism. And this is something we published recently in Tourism Review uh, on how Tourism 2030 and and uh, can contribute to the sustainability development goals and to look into how uh, tourism will be a part of um, what we do for communities. And this is something that we've been talking about since 2017, but actually a lot of um, a lot of discussion is still um, required in order to improve the sustainability of tourism. Um, you'll see the uh, the pyramid of tourism. That's the contribution uh, and the synthesis of the um, the synthesis that we had in the um, uh, encyclopedia of tourism, where we have the tourism system from Nilipia, and we've got resources and and outputs and value being co-created towards equitable returns for resources utilized. And this is something I've been talking about for many, many years since we wrote the first, actually the last chapter on the Chris Cooper book, Tourism Principles and Practices. We wrote that with Chris Cooper years and years ago, more than 30 years ago almost, uh, about equitable returns for resources utilized. So it's really about the sustainability element on that that enables the, the tourism system to operate in a way that is not damaging uh, the environment, does not damage the local communities. And then you've got on the pyramid, you've got the planning management and um, uh, planning management strategy, you've got market forces, you've got the exogenous variables, and you've got the technology and infrastructure that enables all of those things to happen. Um, this bit is open on the encyclopedia, so you can go in and you can recommend that to your students and everybody can can read that. Um, there, are, there are a few entries on the encyclopedia that they're open to everybody. The rest, I'm afraid, you have got to uh, order for. Uh, but but this is, I think, this is the basics uh, for tourism and how tourism is being developed. So that's a little introduction uh, for what I do and, and um, the introduction to, to tourism. Uh, I'd like to bring you a little introduction to tourism review. I'm going to give you some statistics to understand how tourism review has developed in the last uh, few years and how it is changing. So we've got a very international uh, editorial board and you've got several colleagues uh, being on the editorial board. Gary is uh, one of our assistant editors in Malaysia, but we've got a lot of other people all over the, all over the world. And uh, before anybody is asking me, uh, can you please put me on the editorial board, I'll say that uh, people who come on the editorial board are those who actually contribute to that. So in order to be able to be invited on the editorial board, please make sure that you contribute by doing reviews, by citing the journal, by engaging with the journal, by vi being visible in the journal, by writing the journal. So um, we don't give um, uh, positions on the editorial board as a, uh, a, uh, in advance. We do that as a, a reward for people who engage and participate in the community. We are very privileged in Tourism Review because we've got a lot of different topics that we cover. So it's a, it's a very wide range journal. So it can, you can um, unlike other journals that they've got a very specific theme, we are quite, um, quite inclusive in terms of what we're doing. So you can have a whole range of different things that are coming together. And this is something I'm very proud of. It's the statistics and the, and the, and the indexes that, that um, it, it has helped us to develop um, tourism review rapidly. So you can see that uh, the site score in 2023 for 2023 was 15.1. We're already 13.5 for the site score tracker, and we've got a full year in front of us. <coughs> Impact factor 7.3, and um, the most important thing is it's time to first decision in 16 days. That's really important, how fast the journal operates. And those of you who have submitted the interest review, you, you know that we operate very, very fast. That means that we make decisions very quickly. And that is really important because you don't really want your papers to be uh, locked in a journal for three months, for five months before you hear, you hear from the editor. So we make incredible amount of effort 
um, and all my uh, associate editors, assistant editors, and all the uh, reviewers know that I'm pushing them really, really hard to be able to, to do things. Normally, desk rejection is happening within two or three days, and uh, normally, uh, if we ask for revisions, we ask for revisions probably within 32 days. So uh, this is something that's really um, one of the competitive advantages of the journal. Acceptance rates says they are 14%. In fact, I think it's, um, currently it's a little bit lower. I think currently we are accepting for about 9%. Um, we don't set to our, um, we don't set a specific number for acceptance. Um, but we really want uh, the best papers to appear in tourism review. And you've seen what happened over the years uh, in, uh, in, in tourism review and how the impact factor has developed. We got uh, 7.8 in 2022, 7.3 in 2023. Um, there are good reasons for that. Most of the journals, the vast majority went down uh, a little bit because of now the emerging journals apart from uh, from what's happening, but you can see on the line the um, how uh, citations have been increasing for the journal. Thanks to you, of course, because you are reading all these things and because you are citing the journal, you're using the journal in your own publications. And I think that's the most important thing is the impact of the journal, is how it is cited by different people and it's it's um, it is uh, supporting their development it's a q1 journal and that means quite a lot of things because if you have got a q1 q1 journal um, you have a lot of people who are submitting papers so last year in 2022 we had 638 pay, papers in 2023 we had 913 that means plus for 39 percent, almost 40 percent more, pa more papers from one year to another, and um, this year I think we'll have about 1,200 papers. Um, so it's a lot of papers coming through, and we need to look through all of those things and identify what is the best papers we can do. This you can see how many people are downloading um, the 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 articles and um, you can see uh, where they're coming from, from different places. So China normally is number one because of the number of researchers that you've got in China. Uh, but then you've got uh, UK, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, US, Germany, Thailand, and Spain. And you see that um, uh, a lot of people are um, looking globally. And, and that's why what we normally uh, say to people is that the the um, tourism review is a global journal. So if you're writing something about a, a speci specific place, um, it would not uh, it would not interest people from different countries. So therefore, we cannot publish it. And you can see which are the universities where most of the downloads are coming from. Uh, I can see some Malaysian universities there. And thank you very much for your support. But uh, it's 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 a global journal. It's a global journal. You can see how citations are going year on year, and you can see that this is um, constantly growing, and this is uh, a very healthy situation for the journal in terms of increasing the the number of people who are reading and using uh, the the research. And uh, you can see that the the journal is growing in articles because currently we have. Um, We've, we've got so much um, backlog in terms of getting uh, the papers published. So 2024, it's already completed. And now we have got a few more articles to complete 2025. So the space is a premium. And we increase the number of publications from 90 to 100. And um, so we, we can still uh, publish more papers, but we need to be careful on how we grow because we really want to grow with the best with the best uh, uh, papers. You can see the submissions and everything. So that is what is our realities in terms of the journal. And I think your realities in terms of authorship is like that. I traveled quite a lot, and many of you would have met me in different conferences around the world. And everybody is asking me, I would like to publish three papers. And I would like to publish three SSEI papers, please. 
so I can graduate, I can get my first job, I can do a lot of things. Um, but quite often the conversation is quite shallow because people have not done more homework than that. Uh, success is like an iceberg. People see the outcome, but actually they don't see all the bits that you need to have underneath. And I think publications exactly like that. It's it's really about how much sacrifice, how much um, how much intellectual works, how much uh, 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 perseverance and persistence you have put in there, and determination. And and one of the things that's quite interesting is that um, you see a lot of people who are pub who are sending publications not only in tourism review but in in the top uh, top academic journals, and they have not read the latest the latest papers. So if you have not read the the papers from the last two years, you wouldn't know what's the gaps because a lot of the elements that people have done, uh, people are trying to publish, they've been done already. And and I'm saying that not only from tourism review because as you know I'm on editorial board on many other journals and I I review about about ten papers per per week. So you really it's one of the things that you see immediately that. Does the person know the literature, or does the person is ignorant of the literature? And this is the first thing that I I always advise people: read the literature, and find the best the best research, and go at the end of the best research and see where it says future research. And then this is where you really need to concentrate and create uh, the future research. Uh, in tourism review, we need to have theory and practice. So it really needs an explicit discussion about the theory and explicit uh, discussion about the practice because everything we do needs to have impact to society. It needs to be original and that originality needs to be uh, really showcased in the abstract on the introduction and the conclusion. You must say to the editor, what is original about your paper? And, and especially in the abstract, the abstract is, is, is really, really important. Don't forget that we are receiving, as I said, oh, 1,000 articles on the first round, plus the revision. So I read about 1,500 articles per year on Tourism Review alone, never mind about the other articles. So you really need on the first, on the abstract, to be really cre created in such a way that tells me immediately what is new and why is that original? You really need to answer those questions. And I'll let you read through, three, through these questions and understand what, what the questions say. So do I have to say something new? Is this an original contribution? Does the work add enough to existing knowledge? How can you justify your research and your methodology? I'll give you an example. Uh, two years ago, when I was a visiting professor in Hong Kong, um, I wrote two papers with colleagues in Hong Kong about metaverse. These papers are the most cited papers on metaverse. Uh, they are conceptual papers, and they are really trying to design the future for metaverse. Uh, now, if you try to do a conceptual paper on metaverse now, you'll find that's quite difficult to, to say anything new because we've said it all. So now it's about to do experiments. Now it's about to do different methodologies in order to to take forward this. Um, uh, uh, ex um, these conceptual papers into into papers that they can make a contribution. I always find the research onion useful, uh, where Saunders have actually described the different kind of technologies, uh, the different kind of methodologies, and has described how um, the different things fit. And I quite like on when papers are coming through in tourism review that they position themselves and say, this is what exactly we're doing. So you really need to read the journal that you need to target, and you really need to be relevant. You really need to look into the papers that have been um, they have been published in the last two years, and you really need to be part of the journal. You really want to be um, known to the editor, to uh, review for the journal, 
and to engage with the journal. That's the best way of getting involved. And it's not easy. Um, there are not ways of rapid publications and those ways that you may find are not, are not very good. So I will always say that you do, um, you do the hard work and get published. Um, you need to, to write brilliant papers and you need to deal with referees reports and to, uh, to engage in, a, in an honest discussion to, to referees in order to have success. Um, we really need to look into what's a good paper and what is a toilet paper. And it's really quite difficult to distinguish sometimes. And now we, you've got a lot of proliferation of papers that are coming through. And again, a good paper is contribution to theory and theory is universal truth. It's really applied across context. So it's not about one spe specific location. So if you are researching about a, a village in Indonesia, you really need to think about what impact your research has got in, 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 in Malaysia, in Brazil, in, in Norway. And that is really critical in terms of, um, in terms of publication for tourism review. You really need to have a theory and practice that supply then well. I'd like to give you a little bit of the confidential insight story to understand how the process works and how um, the refereeing process works. Uh, once we have, um, we have received the paper, I'm going through and I'm determining whether I've got an interest in, in, in publishing this paper. Now, being a top journal, um, you really need to be selective in order to, uh, to, to offer a contribution to the best, the best uh, papers and to the best science. You really need to look into what's the contribution of the paper in order to make uh, an impact in society and make an impact in theory. Um, so we find uh, we need at the end two or three referees to say, yes, this is a wonderful uh, paper and needs to be published. Uh, but in order to get that, we, we need quite, we invite quite a lot. We invite about uh, 15 uh, referees and we like on the first um, on the first round to have about four reviews, uh, four good reviews in the beginning. Um, sometimes, because we invite quite, quite a lot of people, sometimes we have got more reviews than than others. So um, recently, someone was complaining because they got seven reviews. Uh, back from tourism review and they had to address the comment from seven reviews. Having a lot of reviewers is not necessarily a bad thing uh, because you have got more consultants who are supporting you in publishing your paper. Um, having two bad reviews is really bad. Having six or seven reviews that they are balanced or they've got some that are very critical, some that are supportive, it's probably better for you. So the number of reviews do not do not be afraid of. So perhaps this is the most important slide. Submission is coming in. About 60% of the of the papers get rejected immediately within three days uh, for a whole range of reasons. And 5% are rejected, but we say to we say to authors, look, if you were to fix one, two, three, four, five things, you may be able to do it. So we reject this paper, but please come back with, with a revised one. We send it out to reviewers. Sometimes I'm selecting about 15 reviewers. The maximum we have selected is 37. Um, and we get about, for, for the 35 papers, 35% 35 of the papers we have submitted, they're going to, to reviewing. 20% of these papers um, are rejected as a result of the reviewer's recommendation. And about 15% are invited for R&R, &R, uh, revise and resubmit. And then we're going to the circle where we ask people to revise and resubmit until the paper is acceptable and the reviewers are happy. Um, so in that process, um, we have some papers that are rejected. Normally, it's between it's between five and six percent, and about ten percent of these papers are getting accepted. 
uh, we're quite heavy on desk rejection. Why? Because we don't want people to wait for a long time to get their paper rejected. If we know that we're not going to publish the paper, we're rejecting that earlier. Um, what I always say to my PhD students and my young uh, colleagues is that we really need uh, to uh, make sure that they've got several papers uh, at the same time, so uh, in, in the go, so they can, they can circulate um, this process and they can get more things uh, happening. I think the objective is not to get rejected. Uh, and it's really, really important that you understand that you are not going to be accepted immediately and not get discouraged, but not get rejected. And even very senior um, academics like Professor Oi and Professor Gary, we we still get rejected every day, but we, we are better at uh, knowing how to manage this and, and how to operate this process. This comes from Sarah Dolniger, and he says some, some of these uh, misconceptions, if you like. Um, the editor does not like something, someone, or whatever, or the editor um, does not have a memory. Uh, publishing is like buying a lottery ticket. I'll, I'll try. Editors want to reject papers. Uh, if I can get away with that, it's okay. Or once you survive the uh, one round of review, the deal is done. Uh, so this is not this is not what's happening. It's it's a process of improving quality, and it's a process of engaging in a in a dialogue that that contributes to science and and it, it contributes to society. Now, what I always say to people is that it is important to understand that everybody who is in this process is trying to improve what we do. And it's not about just scoring a publication. It's really about improving the intellectual capability and improving the, the contribution we have to society. Um, so it, it's really about finding the golden eggs that will progress things forward. And um, uh, Gary has sent me a few questions early on, and he said, oh, what is the difference we, of, of the top journals? The top journals are privileged enough and they're responsible enough to select the golden eggs. If you are not the top journal, any eggs will do, but a top journal will really look for the golden eggs because the space is limited and because we've got the capability of doing that through the network of reviewers and through the contribution of what we do. This is some new uh, slides I've added if you have seen uh, my public and uh, my presentation before and it's about ethical and unethical behavior. We find a lot of unethical behavior that's happening right now and I'll show you some of the practices so you understand what unethical behavior is and I'll say something really important and that's the most important thing I'm going to say in this presentation. Please be ethical on the way you are publishing and please follow the uh, all the all the guidelines of the journal uh, and um, especially the young uh, academics and the PhD students, it's really important that we are in this for making contribution to science and society. It is not uh, on to do unethical behavior because um, it does not contribute. And if you have unethical behavior, what happens is that sooner or later everybody knows and sooner or later you get a red flag next to your name and then it's game over. You really don't want a red flag next to your name. We are very explicit on what is allowed and what is not allowed, and we all follow the COP um, uh, uh, ethical um, guidelines. So this is on the website of Tourism Review. Please read that and says what is the responsibility of the authors and what's not the um, the the responsibility of the authors. You really need to include only those people who have made a substantial and meaningful contribution to the submission. Anywhere, any anybody else can go to acknowledgements. We find a lot of uh, unethical behavior here. And you need to exclude anybody who has not contributed to the paper or who has chosen not to be associated with the research. And if I had the time, I'll tell you a lot of different things here. There is an, another thing with ChatGPT and generative AI that is um, has been a factor in publications in the last few uh, months. Um, so there are things that you're allowed to use 
ChatGPT and things that you are not allowed to use ChatGPT. And this is really a clear statement that when you're submitting your research, um, this is really um, what you accept and what you do not accept. So uh, copywriting any part of the article using uh, generative AI is not permissible. Uh, and that applies to images, uh, generation or, or reports of results using AI is not permissible. The index reporting of statistics using uh, gener generative AI is not permiss permissible. Uh, copy editing an article using AI to improve the language and re uh, readability would be permissible as these minor standards tools already employ to improve spelling and grammar. Uh, so it's really, really specific. And now, quite often, um, generative AI is creating text that does not really um, uh, contribute to science. Quite often, it's it's kind of amalgamated from different things, and quite often, it's simply wrong. Uh, especially, especially the citations are always wrong. So that's a quick way to see what is what has been um, created by ChatGPT uh, recently. Someone submitted something to Tourism Review and had a couple of quotations from me and publications from me that I've never written. So that was a quick way of desk reject and red flag because that, that person was trying to cheat the system. Um, I really want you to look at COP and um, look into integrity in research and publications because this is really what all the editors uh, and all the publishers are going by. So read um, the COP guidelines. Um, there are a lot of different um, bad, unethical, illegal practices right now where uh, co-authors are being, um, positions are sold or they are, um, they are um, invited in many different ways. And a lot of these things are leading to retraction. So retraction is when we take a, a paper out and we inform your um the, we inform the um the authorities of the university um that this author has been unethical in the way they're doing that luckily so far i didn't have an instance on tourism review but takes off a little of time and it's really about uh, it's really about um uh, unpleasant experience for anybody who is going through and there are a lot of organizations out there that they are promising a lot of things for money. Please do not um, do not engage with these organizations. The organizations out there, this is about patents, but this there are a lot of organizations that are selling positions in, in, in articles. Again, this is unethical behavior very, very soon. And we know all that. So, and, and because we know, we, we reject all of these things. Um, so a lot of this, a lot of this is bad practice. Please do not, uh, do not go with it. Um, and there are other organizations that are offering citations for purchase. Um, I, and again, you know, this is really bad practice. And sooner or later, um, people realize that the papers are being rejected and authors being banned. Um, I had a, a recent situation where someone in, informed me that. Someone called Gabriel James, or they use that name, um, was telling people that it was me, in, even used my own picture, and was trying to sell services for people to publish uh, papers in journals, not in tourism, in language and literature journals. But of course, um, this was um, deeply disturbing. I had to inform uh, my university, I had to inform uh, my publisher, and I had to inform the police that someone was impersonating me. So be careful who you are dealing with, uh, because there's a lot of fraud out there, and we really need to collectively stop this. Please help the editor. This is um, a few months back when I arrived in uh, Portugal, and uh, I was waiting for my transfer uh, to Aveiro, and uh, I just uh, had uh, half an hour uh, or one hour wait. In fact, I was uh, waiting for Kathy Sue, who was f flying in from uh, somewhere else. 
and um, the hour that I had, I was editing the journal. Uh, and I know all the editors are spending awfully a lot of time um, uh, editing the journal. It's, it, it's almost another, it is another full-time job. Please help us by making sure that what you submit is ethical, by making sure that it is following the guidelines of journals and make sure that you review papers for uh, the journals and you work with us. Be patient because all the editors, they're still teaching, researching, writing themselves, they're managing departments, they're mentoring students, supervised PhDs, doing keynotes, um, they do webinars at seven o'clock in the morning um, and, and all, the, all the rest of it. Please make sure that you review for, for tourism review. And um, you see in a lot of, um, this is the internal system, you see how many people are declining reviewing for, for the journal. If you decline to review for tourism review, we will decline your, we will decline your uh, article in, 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 uh, in return. So if you are not prepared to provide services to the community, we'll, we're not prepared to publish your, your, uh, your article. This is my internal system on how uh, most of the articles are being assigned to uh, assigned to issues, and it's quite complicated because most all the all the issues on tourism review are themed. So if you look on in each uh, issue of the tourism review, has got a different theme. Some of them are consumers, some of them are destinations, some of them are technology, some of them are marketing. So it's really about engaging different things. About 12% they get published from the 10 to 12% of the of the papers that comes in and we're looking for insightful articulate and constructive reviews so when you're doing reviews make sure that you are constructive and you're supporting the the authors in order to improve science um, it is not about scoring points it's not about stopping people uh, to publish their research it's really about enhancing the research and making a contribution uh, quite often you've got conflicting reviews um, so you've got reject um, minor revision and accept on this case um, you need to remember that at the end of the day uh, the editor is the driver the editor makes the decisions and the reviewers are making uh, a consultants to the editor and therefore you really uh, need to work with the reviewers and you need to work with the editor in improving your science um, and those people who are not doing a good job, you know what happens to them. So um, the options of a possible decision are accept, major or minor review, resubmit uh, or reject. Uh, and as I said, most of the papers will get rejected, not because we would like to reject papers, but because uh, the papers are not ready for publication. Learn from this process and concentrate on not get the reject letter. If you are not getting the reject letter, you are, you are winning and you can go, you can go forward uh, to other things. The, may, the editor will make the final decision and if there's a final decision, uh, that's it. Please don't go back and say, oh, I don't, I don't like your decision. Of course, you don't like your decision if it's rejected, but learn from the decision and make the editor's job uh, easy. If everything fails, writer steers is a very nice whiskey that I use from time to time when I get my papers rejected. Uh, but apart from that, it's really about learning how, uh, uh, learning from the process and engaging with the process. How to respond to the referees? Uh, um, it's, it's a report that is going point by point and analyzing all of those things and explaining and having a conversation with the referees. This is from my friend Cleopatra in the Journal of Product and Brand Management. 32 pages of responses. Quite often the response is, 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 um, is um, uh, lengthier than the, uh, than the paper itself. And um, how do the editors decide? I explained already it's about contribution theory and practice. And uh, it's really about does it make a does it make uh, a, a contribution? Now, some journals are not doing it very nicely. So this is uh, from the Journal of Linear Algebra and its applications. Paper was submitted in '95. 
aid was accepted in 2006. I guarantee you in tourism review, we've got 150 days benchmark. So 150 days to get your final decision. Sometimes editors are getting, getting it wrong and the reviewers are getting it wrong. This is uh, the letter Professor Ratoliff uh, received, uh, Latcliffe uh, received um, in 1992, and that's the research that in 2019 got him the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And this is uh, Catalin Carrico, who was denied a lot of publications for many, many years, but she did the mRNA research that, uh, that led to the COVID vaccines later on. So quite often, and Peter Higgs, Peter, Peter, Peter is an interesting case because he didn't have uh, a lot of papers. He wrote very, very little papers. He didn't have any citations. He had, no, he had citations, but only on, on one paper. And for many years, he didn't write any of the papers until, until all his theory was proven uh, and he was given the Nobel uh, uh, for physics in 2013. So for, the, for, for many years, um, uh, Peter was not uh, publishing or not, um, not, not getting very active, but he was engaging in this theoretical uh, physics development, which led him to the um, Nobel Prize. So um, to keep successful, uh, please uh, develop a well-designed original study that is um, using appropriate outlets and really saying an interesting story and then um, highlight the results and make a contribution to theory and practice. Please um, read Tourism Review, especially the last two or three years, download, uh, submit uh, papers, uh, share your papers with your students and, um, and volunteer to review papers. Thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Buhalis, for your uh, insightful sharing. Uh, we will now proceed with uh, the uh, 10 proposed questions. So, uh, Shino will share the slides. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Thank you. No problem. Okay, we'll start with the first question. Uh, so, uh, Prof. So the first question, what distinguishes top tier journals from others and why should researchers aim to publish in them? I think top tier journals have proven over the years that they bring out the best research and they bring the most innovative and the most um, well-developed research. Quite often they'll require multiple studies, quite often they'll engage in many rounds of review and to be frank they'll be difficult, difficult to publish it. And why are they difficult to publish in? Because they've got a lot of a lot of papers coming in. Um, they've got a high citation index, and they've got a high population of well-developed research. Why would you? Why would uh, public uh, researchers aim to publish in this? Um, because they would like to get publishing their papers with the best research out there. Um, and let's face it, right now, we've got in tourism, we've got, uh, we've got 320 journals. Uh, if we say that each journal is publishing, I don't know, about 100 papers per year, we can publish 30,000 articles in tourism per year. Is there good research for 30,000 articles per year? 
probably not. Probably the good research is about 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000 papers per year. And this, these papers are ending up in the top tier journals. It's much more difficult to, to publish there and you and you get good feedback from reviewers, good feedback from editors, and you engage in uh, in developing the intellectual capability and the contribution to theory and practice. I don't know, does, does it answer your question? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Um, and, it's not, okay. and it's not only in tourism, it's in, it's in all fields. That applies in all fields. Um, the, the, top, the top journals will be much more selective in what they do, and they will engage in more um, intellectually stimulating discussion. Okay, uh, Prof, like if someone were to publish in all these uh, top tier journals, would they make any difference in terms of their career progress and so on? Yes, I think so, because I had a, a very painful experience when I was going for my promotion to professor, to full professor. So someone who is not in alive anymore, who was my dean at the time, took my CV and he said, okay, let's evaluate your publications. And I remember he took a, a red pen and started deleting the publications that they are not on top tier journals. And out of 120 publications I had at the time, I was left with five. And he said to me, this is the only ones that they count. And of course I detested them. I said, hold on a second. I, I, I've had so much sweat and blood on the other 115 publications. And he said, this is the only things that they count. I'm not saying that this is right, but I'm saying that a lot of the the deans will be looking to only the top tier journals in proving that um, the science is right and the publications are worth publishing. And now we find that with the, uh, what do we call this model where you pay for, um, to, to get your publications done. I see when I was head of department, I will see a lot of publications coming in for people who have paid to publish their papers. And and you know that quite often this will not be a strong publication. Um, so it it really and and you know when you are evaluating people to become full professors and I'm evaluating for about 30, 40 universities around the world, one of the things that you see is that have they published in the top journals? Or if they do, if they haven't published on the top journals, why they've not published in the top journals? Either they don't read and they don't know, or they are not good enough. So uh, it's it's good that you publish with the best research and it's good that you are contributing the best outputs. Um, and yeah, there is there is a quality element on everything that we do. Okay, uh, yeah. we'll move on to yeah. the second. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Prof, may I ask uh, one more question? How do you define uh, top tier journals? Because different university or different country, they use different kind of ranking. Like, uh, for instance, in Malaysia, most of the Malaysian university they use JCR, the impact factor to measure how good of the journal is. Uh, whereas Australian branch university in Malaysia, they use ABDC to uh, evaluate uh, the ranking of the journal. So therefore, uh, this question actually some uh, young career researcher normally they will ask, Prof, uh, what should I do? If I go for this journal, APDC rank A, but unfortunately the impact factor very low, only one point something, two point something. So, but the university only focus on impact factor. So if that's the case, how shall we, how do we balance? Uh, really difficult question and really um, there's not one answer to that. First of all, I, I hate all the rankings because all the rankings are wrong, number one. Number two, 
Uh, you cannot assume that citation equals quality. Mm. Because again, that is wrong. Um, so that does not help the young the young researchers to actually select what's what it is. The way I look at it is that which are the, the journals that they bring the best research out? If you are if you are in tourism, I'll look in the, the top ten tourism journals. Now if you see all the different um, rankings that you offer, you find more or less the same journals being out. Mm, okay. agree. You'll find that it's not because a lot of a lot of the rankings are based on different different criteria, and a lot of the criteria are being reinforced by one or the other. So those who are serious about the field, they know which are the top journals. And of course, some journals go up and go down depending on citations, whether they had a good year, whether they had a good paper that uh, scored really highly and got a lot of citations for. So a lot of a lot of um, impact factors went down this year because in 2020, <clears throat> a lot of um, some of the some of the papers brought out uh, papers about uh, COVID and what happened it was that the first COVID paper got really really high cited. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. 2020 is now out of the impact factor; is still on site score. So 2020 had very uh, the, so the, the, there was some distortion. So back to your question, and and also let me tell you something on tourism review. Tourism review is an abs one star which is really catastrophic but actually the numbers are still on 2016 data because the abs mm -hmm. was the abs was on 2016 and then they did a very minor mm -hmm. exercise in 2021 that didn't change things and uh, tourism review was not performing well in 2016 everybody knows that and in 2021, we didn't have an impact factor that was significant. Now, if if tourism review is to be assessed now, it would be a two or a three star because it's a, it is it is performing a three star. So, if anybody in your university is looking to the ABS ranking, they'll tell you, uh, no, do not publish in tourism review, publish in some something else. But you also you need to look into how the journals are progressing. So, tourism review has been going um, uh, very. Um, has been a very dynamic journal in the last few years and has been performing really, really well. Mm -hmm. Some others do not. Um, my suggestion to my research students is that publish where you are part of the community. Invest on the journals that you would like to be part of the community. You remember some years ago, we started the tourism ITT, the Information of Tourism uh, and Technology. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was a new journal. It didn't have an impact factor. It was not. But we were publishing there. Why? Because we we believe in the in the topic. We believe in the community, and we developed the journal. Now the journal is performing really, really well. So it's really it's it's a judgment, and it's not it's not. You need to be informed by the rankings, but not be not to follow the rankings at that level. And I know that in Asia you are more. In Asia, you are very numbers focused, um, and I think I think that is not a very good thing to be. You really need to look into the quality of things and really need to engage on different things. That does not mean that the numbers do not matter; they do matter. But but you, you need to be a little bit more uh, holistic in the way you are looking into things. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, should we uh, move on to the second question? Okay, the second question, uh, how should researchers approach the process of selecting the right journal for their work? I think the most important thing is the topic. You know, if you're doing sustainability, you really need to go into sustainability, the journal of sustainable tourism. If you're doing geographies, go to geographies. Um, we are lucky in tourism review because we are very holistic. We can uh, We can publish a little bit of everything. But if you see the last two years, you see the topics that we are we are uh, the topics that we are selecting. So I had I had two or three papers recently on methodology, uh, and if you see 
the journal has not published any any issue on methodology and i was uh, i had a couple of papers so now i thought okay let me publish a, an issue on methodology so um, i'm developing an issue on methodology right now um but how do you select you select you select very respectable journals and you select um the the journals that they write for your uh for your uh topic um and recently sara dolnica um kathy sue xavier Ford, and several of the of 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 the editors of what we call the top top journals um put something on trinet that says um please target the journal because you really need to understand what which journal you're writing for so if it's social science you write for analysts if it's management marketing it's probably tourist management and and you know that that researchers are writing for specific journals so my type of writing is for tourist management because i'm a management marketing person um and and if you see the most cited papers out of tourist management uh, the three top cited ever are mine why because that is my home journal um while you see that i'm not very good with annals because it's social science and you see i don't publish so much on jtr because jtr is more quantitative than i do i do quite a lot of qualitative stuff or, or look into the future Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to the third question. Okay, uh, third question. How can researchers effectively highlight the novelty and contribution of their work in their manuscript? In tourism review, we've got something that's called a structure abstract that is forcing you to write paragraphs according to how we would like the abstract to be st structured. And there's I'll give you a little secret now, and that's a that's a little tip for uh, the people who are attending here. And if you do this, I'll accept your paper. So the first thing I read when uh, a paper is coming in is the abstract. And the first thing I read on the abstract is something that's called findings. So if the findings tell me something exciting, I read the rest of it with excitement. If it doesn't, then it got me in a bad mood. So in the abstract, there's something called findings. What did you found? You did all this research. You, you spend two months, three months, one year, a lot of effort, a lot of, a lot of man, women power what is that you found please tell me there that i found this which is exciting it's new and nobody else has done it then i look into the whole thing and then i look into what happened to the citations you know the previous what the research that decided okay do they cite some classics and that's it do they cite some things in the last two or three years so if you especially in tourism and technology if your citations are about 10 years old you know that this person does not know what's going on so it cannot be novel it cannot be it cannot make a contribution so it, it's a desk reject so a little tip for those of you who have been with us for one hour the findings big bit in your abstract need to be super super strong because that is ultimately the make or break And if you okay. do that, I accept your paper. Agree. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Uh, we move on. Uh, to the next question. Um, how can researchers identify gaps in the literature that are worth investigating? It's quite simple. If you mm -hmm. look into the latest papers we have written, we have published in Tourism Review. They're all going in the conclusion and they say limitations and future research. 
right? At the end of the article, most of the papers, they, they have limitations saying, I've done this research, but actually I didn't have a lot of time. I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have the big sample. I didn't have the ability to do it in six different countries. And they say, in the future, I would be doing this and this and that, or I suggest other people to do this and this and that. This is the gaps that someone else has identified already. So when you start the new article says, Gary Tanwin has published this, this paper and has identified that the future research should be doing this. Guess what? I'm listening and I'm doing it. That's the easiest way of identifying gaps in the literature. The other way of, lo of looking, and, and that's my way of looking into gaps, is, is look forward and identify what is coming my way that has never been done in the literature. So some people are asking me, why are you very well cited? Is this because your research is brilliant or is that because whatever? And I say, no, I just pick up gaps very quickly. So when I wrote about metaverse, nobody was talking about metaverse. Now I'm doing, now I'm working on AI and I'm working on robots and robotics. A lot of people have talked about AI and a lot of people talked about robots and robotics, but I don't think they're very good. So I'm looking to very far away to identify what can be useful to, to society. And I'm identifying gaps by looking to the, uh, the contribution to society of what we have. And that's how I identify gaps. But, but as I said, the, the easiest way of identifying gaps is reading the last two or three years and identify what people say is that's a gap. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we move on to question number five. Um, what methodologies and research designs are most valued by top journals? Well, there is a, a range of different methodologies. Some journals are more quantitative, some others. Um, and some uh, journals, they favor some designs than others. So each journal will do that uh, differently. For tourism review, uh, we would like to have contribution to theory and practice. And that means that quite often we like mixed methods. We are moving more into multi-studies. So you need to have, you, you, a lot of the papers we get is, I collected some data, I analyzed the data, and this is what I found. Um, but the analysis is quite shallow, the implications are quite shallow. We really need to look into an analysis of the data, an analysis of, an analysis of the situation, an analysis of the context. And that you, you really probably need need a couple of studies, three studies to do that. And mixed methods, I find mixed methods being more reliable than one method. But different 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 journals, they do that in different way. I know that some of the journals, they are now encouraging people to have three, four, five um, um, studies. I know that some marketing journals, they'll have six, seven studies over four or five years. Uh, before they, they accept the paper. Um, different journals operate in different ways. In tourism review, we, we would like mixed methods and we would like to see um, how reliable data are and how they can make a real contribution. All right, thank yeah, you. Um, pro on this note, uh, can I also uh, ask a further question? I think this is a very good question because uh, my experience basically, uh, because our background is more towards the quantitative. So a lot of top journal, in fact, we receive this kind of message and say that cross-sectional survey um, cannot generalize the study. All right. And therefore, most of the top journal right now, they would not, they do not actually prefer the survey method. All right. Because of cross-sectional. So uh, normally they will encourage us to go for mixed method. Uh, they, after hearing from your end, I believe that uh, maybe tourism review can go further, go to another level. If let's say maybe in the coming research, this kind of method 
maybe the reader or the uh, researcher can learn more uh, from here. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, uh, maybe your vision or mission uh, for tourism review, but I can see most of the journal now already moving to mixed method, even to uh, multiple methods. All right. Thank because you. Because we are all, we are all going the same direction in a way that, you know, is, is this, is this a reliable kind of research method doesn't make a contribution. And this is what we're trying to do. We, I mean, all the, it's not rocket science. All the editors were in the same boat. We're trying to maximize the value that a paper is is creating. And I, I said recently to someone, I said, they said, why you didn't publish my paper? Why did you reject my paper? And I asked a simple question. I said, would you pay five hundred dollars to buy this research? And would you spend one day really reading in depth? And if you've if you've spent half five hundred dollars, and if you've spent a day reading your research, would you have learned something new? And they've never occurred to them that there's a value into this in terms of the time and Okay, the money makes it a little bit more um, difficult to make a decision because you say, okay, give me $500 to download the paper. Does it give you enough value back? And if you're not prepared to, to give $500 or any number, is it worth publishing it? If people are not going to sacrifice money, time, effort to read this to get the return on investment from the publication that is probably not a good publication <coughs> by the way let, don't take me wrong tourism review does not charge authors to submit anything it's free for it's a sub, subscription model you don't pay anything to uh to publish in tourism review if anybody is asking you for money uh, for Tourism Review, there's an unethical behavior, please report it. Um, tourism Review also is a mixed model um, that you can pay if you like your article to become uh, open access. But in some some areas, in some countries, if the um, submitting author, the corresponding author is in some countries, we've got transformative agreements and you don't have to pay for open access. <coughs> Right, thank you. I think uh, perhaps we can move on to question number six. Yes, Rob, this question is, how should authors handle and respond to feedback and revision requests from journals reviewer? Um, especially, especially when two reviewers, uh, they have a conflict, uh, so-called statement or feedback. I think I think the answer is respectfully. They need mm -hmm. to respect the time that the reviewers, in my case, the reviewers can be, I don't know, we had a situation recently where they had seven reviewers and all of them, they had different kinds of views and not necessarily conflicting, but let's face it, the reviewer has spent half a day reading your paper, giving you feedback, and suggesting things. I'm not saying that the reviewers are always right, but they've spent a lot of time looking at your review, at, at your paper, and creating a review, hopefully to um, to support you in your publication journey. Again, the reviewers are consultants to the editor. The editor makes the decision, okay? So, what a, an author has to do is read and understand the comments of the reviewer, learn from it. It's not about scoring points, it's about learning and improving science. Now, if the reviewer suggests the wrong things, you need the author needs to explain why these are the wrong things. Sometimes you find reviewers that they would like to say things like, they would like the author to write their paper. 
So I would like to write a paper, but the author has written a paper and I'm saying, oh, by the way, what you should be doing is one, two, three, four, five things. Um, there's, a, there's an expression out of the scope of this research, out of the scope of this research that I'm using all the time in my papers. And I say, okay, I respect your suggestion. It's out of the scope of this research and that is a gap and a future says that's going to go. Um, so how should authors handle and respond is respectfully mm -hmm. and in engaging in the conversation. It's arguing back or saying, thank you very much. That's a very good point. It's very valid. I'm going to use it. Or saying, no, um, um, with respect, I don't agree with that because of this and this and that, and we've done that and that and that. And yes, that's a fantastic idea, but this is not something we're trying to do in this in this uh, paper. We'll do that in 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 a future paper. That's the way to do that. And by the way, I expect that all the authors are reviewers as well, because if you are not prepared to review for tourism review, uh, we will not prepare to publish your paper. Because I've estimated that. A paper that is published in Tourism Review has got at least 14 hours of um, 14 hours of expert consultation, unpaid consultation. So Gary has reviewed your paper one or two or three or four times. He has given you some suggestions, and all that out of his good heart because we are not paying reviewers. Nobody is paying reviewers, and the meaning we accept is that you'll go back and have a conversation with Gary. It's anonymous. You don't know who it is, but it doesn't matter to say, yes, we agree. No, we don't agree. And this is how we have done it. And and we we expect everybody in this process to be nice, polite, and, and constructive. So um, sometimes if I see a review that's really, really bad, that says, how did this author um, have the guts to write such a stupid thing? we eliminate the reviewer. We just write the review and say, this is not the spirit. And sometimes we eliminate the review. We, we dismiss the review. Um, and equally, if the author is coming back and saying, how they are these stupid reviewers say these things, we eliminate the author. So it's, it's, all about, it's all about being constructive, and it's all about being helpful, and it's all about developing nice things. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right, uh, we can move on to question number seven. All right, what are some common mistakes that researchers make when submitting to top journals and how can they be avoided? That I think my, the, the most common mistake is rushing into it. They've done the paper and they really want to, to submit it in, but the paper is not fully cooked. Hopefully, and okay. They are really under pressure to for their supervisor from they want to get a job, whatever. They've done it, they've done a the paper, they haven't proofread it, they it's that they don't follow this the the recommendations of the journal, they they don't write the right cover letter. I get a lot of cover letters that says Dear Sarah or or Dear uh, or Dear Kathy. Um because um the the author really uh, didn't understand who they write to, and I desk reject and I say, please submit to the right journal. Um, so the most common mistake is that it's half cooked. It's not very, very well cooked. Um, the second thing is that you don't understand the scope of the research. We don't see that much on tourism review because the scope is quite wide. But if you have got a, a journal the European Journal of Tourism, and it's not about Europe, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, if, it's, if you send to the Journal of Sustainability and it's not about sustainability, you've got a problem. So it's really about the scope of the research, it's really about not not being ready. But the thing that really gets me is that is that it's really rust. So what I say to people, what I say to my students is that take your paper, print it, and put that in the refrigerator for two days. Do not touch it for two days. And then give one copy to your mother, to your brother, to your boyfriend, to your girlfriend to read. 
and then you read it yourself one more time with a very clear head after a long weekend or whatever and then and then you submit it because you don't really want your bad work or your half cooked work to see Buhalis. Because the minute that Buhalis sees that, test rejects and game over. So put that for two days in the refrigerator, physically in the <laughs> refrigerator, and then give that to someone, to two or three people that you trust and say, read this, does it make sense? Where does it not make sense? There are also some professional copy editors, which is ethical to use, okay? And I'm not talking about people who are only reading at your uh, uh, your English. I'm talking about people who read for uh, for meaning as well. They cannot fix it for you uh, because they are professionals and they've got ethics. But what they can do is, I can they can tell you, I don't understand this. This is not clear. So what they do is effectively they are doing a pre-review and uh, for for your papers and and sometimes you see a lot of senior co-authors that people think that if you if you if I include Gary in my publications, Buhalis is going to publish my research. This does not happen. Okay, but what Gary can do is read very carefully and tell you, you know what. Um, this needs improvement, or I'll improve this if I'm co-author. I will edit. I will edit. I will investigate. I'll be the. I'll be the reviewer number two. The reviewer number two is always the difficult one, right? So if you've got the reviewer number two in your own <coughs> team, you're winning. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your good sharing, Ron. Now we move on to another three question, and this is post publication questions. Uh, the first question, uh, question number eight: What strategies can researchers use to increase the visibility and citation count of their published work? Um, I think sharing your publication, and you guys are doing it fantastically well in Malaysia. I mean, uh, I, I follow your social media. Gary, uh, <laughs> Gary. No, yourself and, and Gary and a lot of people in Malaysia, they say, look, look what they've done. Okay. And um, people are taking notice on this and they say, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then they start getting, um, getting uh, to read more about, about this. But also, um, you really need to inform your collaborators. You really need to inform the people that you cited. Um, what what is happening, and you really need to engage in in conversation with all the other the other guys, and and you know you don't need to be annoying about um, every three minutes. Oh, I publish this, and the next day I publish this again, and I publish this. But you need to be helpful to people. You know, you really need to say to people, look, um, I think that this will help your your research, mm -hmm. and it it is really. Um, it is really important that what we do is we don't publish to write another publication. You know, um, in my case, I've got 500 publications. It doesn't matter if I've got 510. It really, the reason why we do that is because we really want to contribute to, to science and to bring things forward. So you, by the, by the more, the more you kind of uh, um, bring the, um, the research out to people that they need it more, and you do that in conferences, you do that in your social media, you send an email to people saying, look, I've just done that and I cited you and you may like to have a look on this. Um, th that's the best way of doing it. Because that then right. drives citations for the paper, citations for the author and, um, and the citations, again, this is not the purpose of, of getting citations, but the citations brings the right people out to see what is the what is the latest kind of research, and then I'm following Gary on 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 different things, and I say, okay, whoa, look what Gary is doing now, and then I'll find the gaps on the latest uh, on the latest papers from from Gary. So that's that's the way you're doing it. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, next question, question number nine. All right. Prof, can you discuss the importance of networking and professional relationship in the publication process? Yeah, this is this is something I've benefited personally a lot. Because if you if you really look into my um, Scopus profile and if you see uh, what I've been doing on my Google Scholar, you'll see that the mo the thing that I'm most proud of is how many people I've worked with. I'm much more proud uh, of that than than a lot of the citations or whatever. It's really about who do you work with and how do you progress uh, your ideas with the help of others and you work on a global basis to develop um, scientific solutions that support uh, society globally. So networking for me has been really, really important and, uh, uh, and, and working with people from around the world because what happens is that um, the solutions are coming out of my research are then applied globally and also working with colleagues from all over the world means that we are spreading the we are spreading the research uh, to everybody around and we move forward to very important things and i've got i've got a very interesting example that happened recently which is the paper with the most with the most authors on do you know how many authors What's the maximum number of, of authors that appear on a paper? Forty. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Huh? What? There's a paper that has been published uh, with fifteen thousand authors. And it's a paper medical about research? medical research, and it's about it's about um, vaccination and COVID. Uh, and oh. and again, the people that they say, "Well, did fifteen thousand people contribute to the paper?" Somehow they contribute to the paper. But this is the this is the extreme networking. But it, it is at the time that the society needed most people to look into a topic and to bring all our brains together and get out of this out of this ghastly uh, virus that 15,000 people managed to get together. And they were all doing experiments in different places. They're all contributing in different ways. And I don't know who con coordinated 15,000 15, people, but they got this, uh, a publication together. I guess there are 50 pages of the names only, and someone is trying to find uh, author 13,322, but never mind. Um, but networking is really, really important uh, because you then work with um, like minded people and you are looking for common solutions in different contexts, and you find the networking is also very important through multidiscipline, multidisciplinary research. I'm a, I'm a strategic management marketing person. I'm looking to work with technology people who are very, uh, their core disciplines technology. I'm looking to sociologists, I'm looking to economists, I'm looking to a whole range of different people to make sure that that we uh, address issues holistically. So networking uh, is really important. Professional relationships is really, really important. Um, and of course, we are all now uh, getting older and you know I've got 20 uh, PhD graduates who are then progressing this but I've worked with thousands of people around the world through my keynotes and through my visiting uh, uh, professorships and, and different things to help people buy into the big uh, uh, the big societal changes and 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 make efforts to go in 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 that way all right thank you uh we come to the last questions question number 10 all right this is to the uh, earlier career researcher how can earlier career researcher build a track record that attracts top journal publications i think the most important thing is is novelty and i think the early career researchers are doing that they are doing novel topics 
can do fantastic job because they are bringing the new things that are coming forward. Um, and that is the way of doing it. Um, they need to engage with the journalists, so speak to the editors, make sure that the editors understand what is your area, make sure that you read uh, the journal in the, uh, the last two years, make sure that you volunteer to review for the journal, and make sure that you're part of the conversation, and that's the way that you're doing it. Um, I've got a lot of PhD students, and I've got a lot of early career researchers that I mentor, you need mentorship, so you find the right mentor, you work with them, and you work with them in a way that you can, that they can contribute to, um, contribute to, to your development. Let me also say something, because I had a conversation yesterday with someone who, who is quite often, he's asking me for things. Oh, Prof, can you make me a panelist in everything that you do? Or, you know, it's all about taking, taking, taking. Um, Think about what is the collaboration. Think about what do you actually bring into the game, okay? Uh, because not about what can I take from you. And, and you know, the senior professors, we are all attacked by people that they say, um, can you please do this for me? And I say, why? Uh, you know, because I would like to progress in my career. Yes, congratulations. Um, it's really about understanding that it's uh, and not a quick game. This is something that we really are all in together, and we are not in together for our personal ambition. That is part of it, but we are all together to provide um, uh, to provide solutions for society. We've got many problems in society. We've got a lot of uh, people who are not privileged. There's poverty. There are a lot of the sustainable development goals. That's why I started from there. We are in this game, and we are privileged in the sense that we are university professors, we are university, um, and that someone has paid for our education quite often, the public sector, the, 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 um, the taxpayer has paid for our education. We really need to go back and, and make a contribution back to society, and we're in a very privileged position to be able to think and to write and contribute rather than go on the fields every day and dig the, the land to get uh, fruit and, and vegetables. Um, so we really need to make sure that um, the contribution is significant. Um, uh, and, and the early career researchers, uh, they've, got, um, they've got rights, but also they've got responsibilities. And I've got to tell to a lot of early career researchers that it has never been easier for them to do that because when I started about, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago, um, I used to be on the University of the Aegean on the a, on a island of Hios when I did my undergraduate degree. If I wanted to have a book, I had to get on a boat for 12 hours, go to Athens and hope that the library still have the book. This is how we, I started doing research. Now, a lot of Early career researchers are coming to me now, and they said, so difficult, I cannot find this information. And I said, you have no idea. And I still meet, you know, some of, the, some of my uh, good friends who used to be on the Greek National Tourism Organization uh, board, that I used to go and ask them to let me stay and photocopy reports and statistics and things like that. that that none of these things existed in digital form. You had to go and photocopy the paper and then go back and type it again on 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 Word Perfect 2, 286 or whatever. You know, I'm an old guy, okay. But but early career researchers have got responsibilities as well, and they need to take that for seriously. And there's not an easy way up. There is a way up is through sincere work and determination. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Prof. Wallis. Uh, very good sharing. Uh, we have another 30 minutes, and now we are going to proceed with the uh, question and answers. Uh, so if you can see in the chat box, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of questions for you. Uh, so I'm just going to start off with the first question. Uh, please. I cannot see you... that. Where is, where is the, uh, where's the chat? Um, is towards, uh, towards the bottom on your left. Yeah, I can only see 
Rosita's comments, but nothing else. Okay. Uh, Prof. Um, Prof. Gary, uh, Prof. Uh, yeah, Wahalis could not see the questions. Yeah. So uh, can you just like. Okay, never mind. I'll start to read the question. Uh, the, the first question, uh, could you please provide some tips to good literature review? What is really expected? How to show theoretical contribution? I guess it's about a systematic literature review and it's not about it's not about how you do your literature review for your PhD. I guess it's about how do you do a, a literature review to publish it. And what we have found recently is that people are using a couple of software to kind of uh, go through a lot of journal articles and come up with some statistics and create some graphs and bang, they are publishing. It's research that you can create in a couple of days and then it has got a very limited kind of contribution. I think there are, there are several very good papers out there that says what makes a good systematic literature review and what we are looking to a systematic literature review that, that gets published in tourism review is something that is creating clear themes. They are making a real contribution to, to theory and practice. And that is the criteria. It's, it's contribution to theory and practice. If you don't have, if you don't have, um, uh, if you don't have contribution to theory and practice, uh, tourism review will never publish your paper. So um, there's a, there's a text that Noel Scott he has done for me as associate editor, and we are sending that to all the papers that we reject on because most of the papers that they arrive on systematic literature review they've done just a few statistics on some um, on a topic and they do not add to theory and practice so uh, scott has created the text that we send out to people and that includes several citations of uh, methodological chapters about uh literature reviews um if you are desperate you i can send that to you if you if you email me Okay, uh, we have another question uh, is from Volos Greece, uh, is from Dimitris as well. Uh, please tell us about the supplementary file. Supplementary? Supplementary file. I think it's the one that we upload online. They want, uh, the person wanted to know what is it about. I didn't get it. Supplementary what? Uh, okay, the question is, please tell us about the supplementary files. Supplementary files. I don't, files. Get, the, I don't uh, get the last word. The last files. word, Gary. Files. F I L E S. F I L E S. Files. Supplementary mm. files. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, sometimes we ask people to um, to provide their data and to provide evidence that they've done the research. Uh, especially sometimes we suspect that there's a lot of fabrication of data right now. And um, what we do is we ask people to provide all supplementary evidence of that, that they they contribute to the product to to the contribution to theory and to practice. So I guess that this is the supplementary files that that um, the other Dimitris is referring to. Okay, uh, we have another question uh, from. Um, okay, I I read the question. The fear of getting rejected at the first instant triggers more fears to write or complete a paper. Please energize us to remove these fears. Uh, <laughs> it's really bad. I know. I face it all the time. You know, I've published, I don't know, 500 papers, and I still, the minute I said reject, I really get furious. Uh, and I know it's not a nice feeling. I know it's not a nice feeling. Um, the only thing with the senior people is that we've seen this feeling so many times that you know how to handle it. And um, and I think, you know, um, the person who is asking that needs to get the right mentorship. Because your senior professor or your senior colleagues will tell you um, first to look at it in a positive way. And 
and I, I write at the end of the publication, I showed you some of the very famous rejection um, cases where um, the author was right and the rejection was wrong. Uh, but but most of the times the rejection is right. And I I met recently in Spain a very young lady who's doing a PhD and she had a very similar kind of question and she was very emotional about rejections. And I encourage her to first look at her um, manuscript very carefully and then submit it to tourism review. And when I saw it in Tourism Review, I thought that it will be, it will be rejected. But I sent that to uh, reviewers, and yesterday I had four reviews back. Three was rejected, one was major review. But when I, you see the comments of the reviewers, <coughs> they're all very helpful comments. And they're all part of the a development process of the next paper to be better. So nine times out of 10, the rejection process opens a new opportunity for improvement. And that is the spirit that, that is done. Um, but, but what I also find <coughs> is that quite often you reject a paper and then immediately the author says, stupid reviewers, you know nothing, and they submit to the next journal. <coughs> Guess what? It is rejected on the, next journal, on the next journal as well. Quite often by the same reviewers. So quite often I get a reviewer saying, I've reviewed this paper and I've suggested one, two, three, four, five things before I rejected the paper. But then, but then the author um, submitted the paper to another journal with exactly the same, the, the same shortcomings. And I have the same opinion as I had last night. So mm -hmm. it's really about learning and improving the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the next question, uh, how do I volunteer to become a reviewer for Tourism Review? You just send me an email and you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and this is my Google Scholar profile, and that's my area of expertise. Okay, um, the next question, um, let's hold on. Okay, this is an uh, interesting question. Uh, good morning. Thank you for this webinar. I have a question about a paper currently under revision for a top tier journal. The editor said that my reference are too heavily built on French literature and should include uh, more reference in English. I have changed my theoretical framework to include more references in English, but reviewers now say that this framework lack consistency. Any idea to address this issue? Speak to the editor uh, and the editor will help you. Um, the editor will help you. I mean, sometimes if, if, if the literature is in a different language uh, and it's not accessible to the reviewers, they may not have seen this. Um, but again, if, if, your, if your research is looking only into the literature in French, publish it in French. <laughs> publish it in the journals that you are you are quoting, you know, that the journals that you're citing. If 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 your if your um, paper is trying to uh, to address an issue that's particular in, particularly important in France, do it in a French journal. You don't need to do it in a in a in an English speaking journal. Because if you'd like to be in a top in a top <coughs> journal, in a top tier journal, it happens to be in English, you need to know the global literature. If you don't know the global literature, that means that you cannot make a contribution to knowledge and, and practice. So it's a, it's one of these things. 
Interesting. Uh, okay, the next question. What is the limit between getting your work known to others for the purpose of knowledge transfer and self-promotion? Do you think that is an ethical issue? Okay, do you think that there is an ethical issue on the matter of excessive self-promotion? That's a very interesting one, and it's a very personal one, and it's very <sighs> difficult to kind of determine what's the limit, and I think that the limit is very personal. Um, there are certain people I'm tired of looking to their profile because they are so self-promoted. Oh, I submitted the paper. Oh, I got the reviews back. Oh, uh, yes, another thing. Yes, another thing. Then eventually the paper was accepted. Uh, yes, the paper was published. Yes, the paper has got something interesting, an interesting construct. And I say, forgive, you know, get a life. Really get a life because you're spending so much time of, and sometimes, you know, you just don't follow this uh, person anymore. Um, it's it's a very different kind of, um, it's a very personal kind of thing. Some, some people think that what they do is excessive self-promotion. I don't think I do excessive. I think that I'm, I'm sharing content that's useful to people and gives a little bit of character because a lot of people, you know, see Bukhali's papers and stuff like that, but they don't know much about my life. So sometimes I'm using that, I'm using my social media to kind of um, humanize, if you like, um, the science. Uh, but some people are, are doing that. It's a very personal thing. And I, I don't think you'll please everybody. Go with yourself and go into with your limits. And if you lose a few people that they think it's excessive self-promotion, so be it. I recently uh, banned someone, uh, blocked someone from my social media because they're complaining that I was doing too much. And I said, okay, uh, you don't need to read what I do, so get out. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's really a, a limit, but that limit is very subjective. Okay, hey, um, another question. Uh, how should we address reviewer comments that significantly increase the word count? Usually the paper is originally within the word limit, but after review, it may go above the word limits. Then we need to delete some parts. <clears throat> this is a really difficult question, and this is something I've spent a lot of time dealing with because until recently, Tourism Review had the limit of five and a half thousand words. Now, we are going up to 8,000 words. Um, and I don't know the answer. I really don't know the answer. It's really about having a negotiation with the reviewers and having a negotiation with the, with the, um, with the editor and saying um, the situation is that if I do that, it's another 3,000 words. So if it's another 3,000 words, that means that the, that the paper, that, that the suggestion says, thank you very much. We really appreciate that you would like to look into one, two, three, four, five things, uh, but that's uh, future research. Uh, it's out of the scope of this research, it's future research, so we're not going to do that. But sometimes if the reviewer, if the re reviewer is right, um, you, may, you may streamline the, the text to include other text. And I find I find a lot of um, the papers that are coming to us review. They've got a lot of words that they are not necessary, especially over connecting. Uh, in this vein, however, probably um, uh, things like in on the one hand and on the other hand, there are, there are some expressions that I I hate. So um, some of the some of the authors have received the. Uh, um, a text that said, can you please eliminate these 50 words that you're using that do not add value to the text, but they are just confusing or they add volume, but not value. <coughs> but, it's a diff but this is a difficult question because sometimes, sometimes that's a problem. Okay, uh, Prof, I, I have another question, uh, but I'm not sure whether this question is suitable. Uh, Prof Bohalis, I heard that Amaro has this program called Manuscript Transfer Service, where if my paper is not suitable for tourism review, it may be recommended to transfer to other suitable journals. Do you know about uh, how this works? Yes, uh, it's, it's a very good question. One, 
what we see often is that the a, a paper is coming to tourism review that we cannot publish in the tourism review because either on the focus or because of the quality. So what we do is um, if we see value, we are passing things to other journals. For example, if it's hospitality, um, so we are in Emerald. So we've got uh, a, a, a family of about eight journals. So if it's a hospitality paper, quite often I'll pass it on to my good friend Fevzi on International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management. If it's a if it's a tourism and technology paper that I do not want to publish, I may pa pass it to Chihan on the uh, Journal of Tourism, uh, Hospitality and Tourism Technology. Uh, and what happens is that you get uh, on the rejection paper from Tourism Review, you get a link and says, "Would you like your paper to be moved to this journal?" And then the editor of that journal starts the process again. Sometimes they look into the reviews and what feedback you had already, and then um, they start the process again. I, I also get uh, uh, papers submitted to this review that have been sent from another journal. So Contemporary Hospitality, for example, will send me papers that they are more tourism focused rather than hospitality journals. So we exchange between ourselves. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, another question is, uh, do you check for AI uh, similarity for uh, tourism review submission? Yes, we do, and quite often it screams that is um, that is similar, that is um, AI generated. And and we do, and 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 all the all the publishers are becoming much more clever with the software we, we use. And quite often, you don't need to even to look at it because it is desk rejected on novelty. Because if if AI can write it, so it has been written by other people before, so it's not new. So quite often, we don't even need to go there. We just we just uh, desk reject it on novelty. Hey. Interesting, Prof. Uh, someone asked another question regarding uh, similarity. Uh, what is a threshold for tourism review? We don't have a threshold for tourism review, and uh, Emerald journals do not have a threshold. Uh, but of course, the more you see, the the higher the number, the more alert you are. Um, but then you look at the report, and sometimes you know you've got the, you've got common phrases that we use in methodology, and the software picks it up. So, so statistically significant that uh, or this research has been done, and um, sometimes the similarities come from the uh, references. So we look into into the reports, and we see, of course, if you if you, if you see text that's being lifted from other from other papers, it's uh, it's of course a, a desk reject. Also. Self-citation is really important. A lot of people have not realized that. But if you're sending a paper to a journal, to, to a conference, and then the conference proceedings are published, and then you send the paper, a similar kind of paper, even if it's the same authors, um, then it's, it's, it's self, um, it's, <coughs> it's self-plagiarism. That's equally bad, because you've published this thing before. So be careful what you're doing with that. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we have another last uh, remaining five minutes. Uh, Prof, do you have any questions that you want to uh, ask? No. <clears throat> no, I think it's good sharing today. Very insightful sharing. I think I have learned a lot. So yeah, no further questions from my end. Yeah, it's Prof, amazing. Uh, it's been two lot. hours. Eh? Yes, yes. There's a lot of uh, thank you notes. Yeah, thank you. Notes on your uh chatbot. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, prof, probably the last questions. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh advice to all the young scholars, researcher? Yeah. Before we end the webinar. I think the very important thing is to realize that uh, this is not a game in the way that we are just playing this in a tactical ways. So it's a it's a really a journey of um of science and a, a journey of of truth exploration 
for a purpose. And the purpose is not your promotion, it's not your better life. It's really about contribution, contribution to society. And I think that's a very important thing for people to understand. It's not you're not doing science to improve your life. Your your life is good enough already if you if you're privileged enough to do science. Your life is good enough already. There are a lot of people suffering out there. So um, we are doing science for improvements in the quality of life, in the society, in the communities, and in uh, in 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 uh, in, in um, society in general, globally. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, do it properly. There are no quick ways. There are no ways of making uh, things move very quickly and do that. So take the time, work with colleagues, collaborate in an honest and ethical way, work with senior people, not because it's good to work with senior people, but because they've done it and they've got 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of experience. And they've had, they've learned through the process, hopefully, and they had, more rejections than you can ever imagine. So they've learned how to deal with these things and they can guide you. And um, participate in the community, review papers, learn from the process, engage with, um, with, with the global society. Go to, go to conferences if you can, uh, speak to people, get yourself out there, learn from that experience. And that's the best way of doing it. And it's not always, it's not going to be easy, but nobody said it's going to be easy. And if it was easy, everybody would have done it. You know, some of my PhD students come along and say, oh, but it's difficult. I said, not everybody will have a PhD. So you have privilege of doing one, enjoy. And, and learn from the difficulty. And also whatever you benefit from this, pass it on to the next people. Why do I wake up early in the morning to do a webinar at eight o'clock in the morning uh, for two hours and see Gary smiling uh, on a July morning because we are passing on the flame and we're trying to get more people to understand how to do these things and contribute to society because each of us can do a contribution but collectively we can do much more. Okay, thank you, Prof. Very well said. Um, okay, so uh, thank you all. But before we end, uh, Chino, uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, I'd like to thank Prof. Ruhalis for your insightful sharing. And um, to Prof. Ui and Prof. Gary, um, thank you, you know, for your invaluable contribution as moderator. Um, on behalf of Emerald Publishing, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you find our session informative. We value your support and we look forward to seeing you again in our future event. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Buhalis. Make thank sure you that so you much. read Tourism Review, cite Tourism Review, review for Tourism Review, and you submit your papers in Tourism Review. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. See you, bro. Look forward, okay. to, look forward, you, bro. Look forward to seeing you in Malaysia. <laughs> I hope so. Let me know when. Then, then you can dance together with Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> have fun. Whatever you do, have fun at the same time, right? That's the important thing. We should, we should, we should. We look forward yeah. to seeing you, bro. Okay, take yeah. care, bro. Bye-bye. See you. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.